Hello. Today I will be discussing about the uric acid and its relationship with diabetes. We can say it's the unnoticed element in diabetes management. Starting with the prevalence of hyperuricemia. Overall, the estimated prevalence of hyperuricemia was 9.3% with 8.4% in male and 10.2% in female participants. Now coming to the definition of hyperuricemia, when do we call it hyperuricemia? Usually when the uric acid level is higher than 6.8 mg per dl, we call it hyperuricemia. Now what makes uric acid goes up? Uh, if we broadly categorize the causes that lead to hyperuricemia, we have two categories. Um, the first one is underexcretion, and the second one is the overproduction. The underexcretion uh, is the one that is usually uh, causing the ten percent of the causes, and the overproduction is usually causing the ninety percent of the causes of hyperuricemia. Uh, so alcohol, uh, obesity, insulin resistance are the factors that can lead to hyperuricemia. And there are some medications like diuretics, for example, thiazide diuretics and loop diuretics. There are some anti tuberculous drugs like pyrazinamide and ethambutol. There are some um, immunomodulators like tacrolimus and cyclosporin. And of course, some low dose aspirin or niacin can lead to hyperuricemia. And uh, hyperine diet can also lead to hyperuricemia. Now, here is the physiology of uric acid production. The purine uh, leads to intermediate compounds and uh, that is broken down into hyposanthine that is converted into xanthine in the presence of an enzyme called xanthine oxidase and that enzyme converts xanthine into uric acid. So this blue colored enzyme is the important enzyme that uh, leads to uh, uric acid formation. Now, the symptomatic hyperuricemia develops late. Let it, that is, if the hyperuricemia is untreated, uh, that can lead to uh, gout in 22% of cases, or that there is a 22% chance of developing gout. Now, symptomatic hyperuricemia, the monosodium uric acid crystal deposition can lead to gout formation. It can also lead to uric acid renal disease like renal stones. Now coming to the hyperuricemia and diabetic kidney disease. Uh, diabetic kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, this study is the recent one uh, that was published in BMC Nephrology in 2021 and that was a cross-sectional study. According to that, uh, overall 701, that is 50.14% patients had diabetic kidney disease with a median age of 59.71 years. And the older age, higher triglycerides and low HDL were associated with diabetic kidney disease. Now, hyperuricemia and diabetic complications. Diabetic kidney disease develops in approximately 40% of patients who are diabetic and is a leading cause of chronic kidney disease worldwide. Now, how hyperuricemia lead to the diabetic nephropathy? Each 1 mg per dl higher baseline serum uric acid results in 10% increased risk of low EGFR or diabetic nephropathy. Hyperuricemia greater than 9 mg per dl is associated with three times higher risk for chronic kidney disease and this study was published in 2017. Now, how hyperuricemia can cause diabetic complication? As we all know, it can lead to inflammation which is uh, uh, followed by oxidative stress. Then endothelial dysfunction of course will be there then there will be inhibiting that will inhibit insulin pathway and uh, when there will be less perfusion to the kidney there will be activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system and there will be thrombus platelet adhesion that will lead to the diabetic complications or diabetic nephropathy here are the stages in the development of diabetic nephropathy stage one is the pre-nephropathy there will be glomerular hyperfiltration stage two is the silent stage there will be only thickened basement membrane stage three is the incipient stage in which there is microalbuminuria that is less than 300 milligram per dl of uh, albumin in the urine stage four is the overt diabetic nephropathy that is microalbuminuria uh, that means more than 300 milligram per dl of the albumin in the urine and stage five is uremic that is end stage renal disease 
Now coming to the glomerular classification of diabetic nephropathy, stage 1 is the glomerular basement membrane thickening that can be seen by light microscope or electron microscope. Stage 2 is the mesangial expansion. If it's mild, it's a stage 2a. If it's severe, it's a stage 2b. The third one is a nodular sclerosis, of also known as Kimmel steel wilson legend. And the stage 4 is advanced diabetic glomerular sclerosis. Now, how do we diagnose diabetic kidney disease? We have to send some blood and urine tests for our microalbumin level. We send renal function testing like creatinine level, and we calculate the creatinine clearance and glomerular filtration rate. Then we can send imaging tests like x-rays and ultrasound, CT scan and MRI. Then and last, we can go for a kidney biopsy. Now, what are the treatment options for hyperuricemia? They are broadly categorized into three types of therapy. The first one is uricostatin. That means it inhibits xanthine oxidase, the enzyme that leads to the uric acid formation, for example, allopyrinol and fiboxostat. The second one is a uricosuric that inhibits uric acid reabsorption, for example, propnisate and sulfine pyrazone. And the third one is a uricolytic that, is, that degrades uric acid, for example, uricase. The first choice of serum uric acid lowering agent is the xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Now there are some points that we have to keep in our mind uh, when we are going to prescribe febuxostate or allopurinol. Uh, there will be no renal dose adjustment needed if the patient has having creatinine clearance of more than 30 ml per minute for febuxostate. But if the creatinine clearance is between 15 to 29, the maximum daily dose should be limited to 40 mg per day. Whereas for allopurinol, if the creatinine clearance is 10 to 20 ml per minute, then 200 mg once a day is given. And if the creatinine clearance is less than 10 ml per minute, then the overall dosage should be 100 mg once a day. Coming to the hepatic dose adjustment, there will be no adjustment needed if the patient is uh, in child per class A or B, but use with caution in severe liver disease. For allopurinol, we have to use with caution. Special consideration, we have to monitor the sign and symptoms of MI, atrial fibrillation and stroke if the febuxostate is prescribed. And for allopurinol, we have to check allergic and hypersensitivity reactions that can be lethal. Now the efficient reduction in uric acid, there is a research that was published in 2017 um, that showed that febuxostate reduces serum uric acid better than allopurinol. And, uh, Another study that was published in 2018 showed febuxostate improved EGFR in comparison to allopurinol. This is the recent study uh, that showed that febuxostate had a better safety outcome compared with allopurinol, which was a composite of urgent coronary revascularization and a stroke. I hope this uh, video was helpful for you all. Uh, do uh, try to share your precious reviews and uh, did you like it or did you uh, find any uh, thing that you think should be corrected and do let me know in the comment section thank you so much